Hello. Um, hi, my name is Nicoletta Glinazzi, and I'm here today to talk to you about Arcas. And this is Arcas's logo. Uh, obviously, it's not the EuroSciPy one. And I'm going to be talking to you about using Python to access open research literature. I would like to start off by just saying a few things about myself. Um, I am a first year PhD student at Cardiff University. And there I study game theory, which is what this logo stands for. Um, I'm here today not only representing Cardiff University, but also the Software Sustainability Institute, which is an institute in the UK that tries to make sure that all researchers such as myself uh, use reproducible and sustainable software in the UK region. So I started my MSc, um, MSc my, my PhD studies nearly a year ago. Sorry, let me just fix that. Yeah, and one of the first things that I came across was an illustrated guide to a PhD by Matt Might. Just to summarize what the um, guide is saying, um, I'll be using this picture. So I would like you to imagine that all the human knowledge is between the, um, gray, the gray um, outer circle so that's where the bounds of the human knowledge lies. And what Matt said was, OK, in the first years of education, uh, when you go to primary school and then to high school, the way our education is expanding, our knowledge is in a circular way. And that is because we've been taught various subjects, from literature to science and even gymnastics, right? But uh, once you start your undergraduate level degree, um, you start deviating towards a very specific direction. And this little first arrow is just me choosing to do my undergraduate in business analytics and information systems. So then I managed to push just a bit further when I did my master's uh, degree. But then it was a big question, how do I get from there all the way to the bounds? And that is what a PhD is. And the big difference with the PhD and the rest years of education is that the first time you don't have someone there to teach you. And how do you, so how do we do that? How do we do this leap of faith? And that's actually, uh, you do that by doing literature review. So literature review is going back, reading what other researchers have done in your field, understanding the historical concepts of your field, and maybe, just maybe, at the end of the day, you will manage to push that bound just a bit further. But how do we conduct a literature review? Um, so we read articles. And though I'm, all, I'm sure you're all familiar with the process, uh, please let me go through it again. A researcher, a researcher comes and he he or she develops, writes a paper, and the paper will go through the journal. The journal is not only in charge for reviewing the article, but also publishing it. The review process is a back and forward process between the journal and the researcher. And once the journal gets a thumbs up by uh, the reviewers, then it publishes the, the paper. So once a paper has been published, how do we get to find it? Well, in 2017, and there are many uh, journals have the websites online and the databases and to our uh, preprint uh, uh, pre service as well. So just a demonstration, let's just say that I've been looking for articles that have to do with sustainable software. I'm going to demonstrate what I would do. I would, I would open my, my web browser. I would go to archive, which is a preprint server, just, just an example. I would go at the search here. I would type what I want. I want sustainable software. I would press enter, and I would have some answers back. And you can see I can get various articles. Um, one of them is visit experiences with sustainable software. But let's say I want to keep track of what I'm doing. I want to keep track of the articles. I would open up a date an editor, and I would start copy-pasting the information that I want. And let's just say that I want the metadata for now. And the metadata is the title, is the, nom the name of the authors, is the year, is the journal. So I want all this information. But let's just say I want to do that for 100 articles. So it would take me approximately 0.5 minutes to open my web browser and do my search. But then it would take me 1.5 minutes to copy for each article all the information that I want into an editor. And that would be 1.5 times 10, uh, times 100. And then just imagine that the journal has pages, right? So you have to click to the next page and keep it in the reloads to get the next article. So it would take me two hours and, three and, a, and 35 minutes to get the information that I wanted. Is there a way to do this faster? And yes, there is. There's something that we call API. So an API is just a, is a way from the user to communicate with the database of the journal straight away. And you do that by writing a query. And so you talk to the API. So back in my example again, I want to talk to the archive API. I know that the archive API has a standard URL that you, I have to answer, I have to type there. 
And then all I'm just saying is, okay, I want in the title the sustainable software to exist. 100% is just the space character here. So the API will say, okay, this is your results. And we can see, visit experiences with sustainable software. The article is still there. So this is an XML file. And the problem with that is that it will take me some time to actually take the information that I want from the XML file to parse it. Uh, so let's say I'm just going to write a script and it's going to do it for me. So it will take me 15 minutes to learn to speak to the API. It will take me one minute to write the query. Uh, but it will take me 15 minutes approximately to understand what the answer looks like, what the information I want, and write my script. So we're down to one hour and six minutes, which is way better than before. But there's another question now. What if I'm not only looking for articles from archive, but I want to go to various other journals or preprint servers as well? Well, I'm going to have to learn to speak to the other one. So that's a query for the archive. And this one is for plus. So we can see the difference is small, right? Instead of the standard URL still exists, and then instead of TI, now I write title. But there are other APIs, and the way to speak to them is even more complicated. But it's not just three APIs, right? It's more. It's more than six. And it's not just the way you speak to them that is different, but it's also the answer you get back that is different. So that's the problem that I came across when I was contacting my literature review. And I thought, oh, what am I going to do now? And I decided to build a library for this. So Arcus is a library that works as a translator between the user and the APIs. You can pip install Arcus, and all you do is, I can import it. I'll say again, in our example, Create an object that knows how to speak to archive. Then I'm going to talk to archives like I'm a human being. So I'm just going to say, title is this. I want one record, and I want to be the first record in line. Archive is going to create the URL in the way he knows archive speaks. He's going to get the request. He's going to make the request. He's going to get the answer. And he's going to translate it again in the way he knows archive speaks. And I'm saving to a JSON file. Uh, JSON file just because I think it's more readable and it works good with uh, large data. So here's the answer I'm getting. And once again, we can see the visit experiences with sustainable software is there. But what happens now if you want to speak to more? We said Arcus is a translator, right? So it's quite easy to speak to the other APIs. All I have to do is write a list with the APIs I want to create objects from. And the only piece of code that changes is this one because now I'm writing to a different file. And the only thing, there's a try and expect. Uh, Except uh, because um, if the API doesn't have softwares with the, uh, articles with this title, it's just going to bring uh, a Boolean variable. So the type error is going to be wrong. So we're just going to pass. So now it will take me 15 minutes to read about Arcus, write my script. It will take me five minutes to run it. So I'm down to 20 minutes to collect the articles that I wanted. So I actually did that. I did run a script, and I did look for articles that have sustainable software in the title. Because one of the questions you can get is, OK, you're not actually collecting the article itself. I'm just collecting metadata. So what's the value of these metadata? So here we can see that I collected 87 articles in total, and I, can, I created a time plot. Why? Because the well, thing is interesting. Now, you can see that the first article that I collected was in 2004, which is quite recent. So the articles that contain sustainable software are quite recent. Um, also, we can look at the provenance. And here we can see that I, I tried uh, four different uh, journals, but I only had answers from IEEE, Archive, and PLOS. And another thing we can also do, uh, which I find quite interesting, we can look at the core authors' uh, connections. So this plot doesn't really look really good, but it's actually really interesting because the cycles are the authors that are in the data set that I collected. And if the two um, circles have a line between, it means that these two people wrote together. And why it's quite interesting here that we can see that some clusters exist, like this one and this one here. And also what's really interesting, we can see that this person is connecting to um, two clusters. So it would be nice to see who influenced who and how. And that person happens to be Beardrich. Uh, I'm not familiar with the lady, unfortunately. And going back to the workshops that we attended these days, uh, things like Network X, all these, how we measure the, de the degree centrality and all these things, or um, machine learning algorithms to categorize, um, to categorize the art from the article or the abstract, all these methods could be applied to the data that you are collecting. Uh, just to finish off, I would like to tell you a few things about how Argus work. So its API is implemented in a folder itself, and it has the methods that uh, let Arcus know how to speak to its API. 
If there are similar methods, they will belong, they will be written in tools pi. And what is actually nice is really easy to contribute. So if you wanted just to implement an extra API, you would create a folder here and you would make sure you test it. And just following best practice, of course, uh, Arcas has a documentation and you can find our line at uh, Arcas read the docs IO. Um, just finish off, uh, Arcas also works as a command line tool. So here again in our example, I'm just saying, okay, take the API archive with the title to be sustainable software and I want you to return me one record. Uh, all information about Arcas and myself, yeah, you can find here and thank you very much. Questions? Uh, the, thank you for the talk. Um, what about Google Scholar? Um, if I want to implement Google Scholar, comparing Google. Any, any API that you can uh, include in the project? So yes, there are various APIs that I, uh, there's an issue on Arcas with all the listing all the APIs. Uh, Google Scholar is one of them. Um, last time, uh, which was nearly a year ago that I tried, there were some issues with Google Scholar uh, that I couldn't get through. but. Um, it is on the issues. I'll be glad to take a look if I could implement. Yeah, uh, yeah it looks, looks like it's really cool. I've also been having a lot of issues doing better literature research. Um, do you have like any, um, any means of uh, looking at uh, citation metrics or something like that? Like, could I say, okay, show me the most cited articles containing these keywords or something like that. There's many services where you can do that from your browser, but they're all super slow and super annoying. It would be so much cooler if you could do this from your terminal. So the only issue with this, because uh, I was trying to score my articles, um, it's not all APIs return the number of citations. Uh, PLOS actually returns um, a score that they contact themselves, but uh, it's not easy to get the number because the API itself doesn't return it. And that would be something else that uh, I would have to do. But doesn't come back as a result, if that answers your question. Is it a question now? Ah. For the recording, it would help if you uh, use the mic. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for your, for your nice talk. Um, just a quick question. I've been using throughout my degree program Mendeley. Yeah. Um, so I do not really see the difference, because there I can basically do exactly what you do, but with a nice GUI. With nice? Can you repeat that? With a nice GUI, instead of using Python and this command line interface. So, I use Mendeley to get my citations, uh, but I've never... I didn't see how... Um, I, I could be wrong. Um, Mendeley does not return me the data in the format that I like, that I want to have like this big data set to collect, to uh, then analyze my data set. And again, Mendeley, I have to find the article and then say, OK, Mendeley, here's an article, take it. Uh, with Arcos, I can just randomly look for a specific title, and it just saves everything for me. Well, you, can, you can do that. You can search in Mendeley for sustainable software and just add everything to your library and export it to, um, to LaTeX, to your BibTeX file, or whatever. It's a good argument. Uh, can I just go software sustainable, save me 100 articles in my library? Yeah. I'll, I mean, some, some of these articles are obviously behind a paywall, but at least you got the, the meta information and then can have a look into you. That'd be something to look at. And that's, sorry. Thanks. <laughs>